Hello, I'm Nicola Bryant, and this is The Sirens of Audio. Wow, I'm in it now. <sighs> okay, so I've talked about that. Okay. Have you got um, notes, another Wayne? <sighs> yes, I do. Wow, your notes. Don't hassle me about it. I actually wanted to be prepared for our guest. I am so impressed at your notes. <laughs> G'day audiophiles, this is The Sirens of Audio, the show that explores the universe of Doctor Who on, in the audio medium. I'm Dwayne. And I'm Philip G'day, Dwayne G'day audiophiles. And joining us from the Doctor Who show, it's Dave Kitchen. G'day Dave. G'day, how are you all? Yeah, great. Welcome Dave, good to have you aboard. Thank you, it's very uh, kind of you to invite me. Now, the reason I asked you on was so I was recently listening to one of your episodes of the Doctor Who show, I can't remember which one it was now. Um, and you had mentioned that you had recently listened to one of the stories that we're going to talk about tonight, Prison in Space, which is a lost story that was produced by Big Finish oh, about 12 years ago now. And uh, I thought, well, there's a good opportunity to to get Dave on the show, because I know you're not a, a big audio listener, but you do listen to some. Yeah, that's correct. I probably didn't get into them at the time they all came out. Now I sort of look at the great big mountains of Big Finish and get a little bit intimidated. But I do dip in from time to time, and I particularly dip into some of those special ranges like the lost stories, the novelizations, the plays, um, missing episodes, those sort of things. They're the ones I really dip into, particularly including the Prison of Space on this occasion. All right, we'll get to that in a moment. Uh, and also, we're going to be talking about a companion chronicle called The Perpetual Bond, but we won't get you to stick around for that, Dave. I know you didn't listen to that one. But before we get to that, you know what, Philip? What, Dwayne? Uh, we are going to jump down the rabbit hole. Let's go. <laughs> Right, guys, because you're with us, Dave, I know you're a big fan of the black and white era, particularly the Hartnell era, which is a different era to what we're going to discuss later on, but still part of that black and white era. Now, I think all three of us were were kids or teenagers during the 80s, uh, but if you're like me, Dave, uh, I think the black and white era is pretty magical, and uh, I, I, I suspect you feel the same. I want to know what, what makes it so magical for you. Yeah, look, the Hartnell era is definitely my favourite era, and the 60s is definitely my favourite decade, so I, I do love it, and I was not even born in the 70s, I was born in the 80s, so um, as, as you say, it's something I have come to, and look, there's a number of points I could make, and I'll, I'll maybe make a couple of them briefly and then get uh, other comments and we can sort of come back to what we want to explore, but first of all, the TARDIS crew, the Doctor, I think that Hartnell is just a definitive, wonderful Doctor, he's not the grumpy old bigoted bastard that Stephen Moffat wrote. He's a he's a much more interesting, fun, in, uh, intelligent, complicated sort of individual. And I love his portrayal. I love Ian and Barbara. I love Vicky. Uh, I love a number of the companions there. So the TARDIS crew is great. But this idea in the 60s that they really were just exploring without any boundaries, without any limits, and they could go to worlds where Anything could happen. Bizarre concepts that just would be cynically shot down these days were allowed to happen. They were trying all sorts of innovative things. Uh, they were just going to all different places in time and space, particularly the past, which I'm a very big fan of, Doctor Who sparked my love of history, and that really does come from the 60s. Uh, and the final point I make is just the, the writing. This is a time when the production team, and particularly the writers, were still writing as though these were radio plays or as though these were stage plays, and they are a slower and more lyrical form of writing and of character. And that ability to really get into the story with just this, this delicious 
writing, this sort of magical style of writing, is something that I think has really been lost in almost all forms of media these days. Maybe some really independent TV or movies might still have it. And and maybe that's one of the reasons why some of the big finishers work so well, because they have the time and space to do that. But it is just so lovingly written. So a few dot points from me. What about you guys? I think that for me, the the Hartnell era... Yeah, it is. It is a magical, the, probably the most magical. It's the most experimental, I think, the show ever was. I think right up until season three, it was still finding its groove. And while it was finding its groove, it was doing some pretty amazing things. And then it, it hit that kind of groove and it kind of stuck there ever since. So it's never really been the same since uh, season three, I, I would say. No, I, I think I think I think you're right. Every era, when we sort of look back now, whether it's the Trouted era or the Pertwee era or the Hinchcliffe era or the Jane T era, however you want to define these different eras, we define them because they have a particular style and tone and vibe. Hinchcliffe era, I think, is a wonderful era, but it does a thing really, really well. But it does that thing. Um, the Eccleston era does its thing again. I love the Eccleston era, but it's doing a thing, whereas the Hartnell era is doing everything. Yeah, and I know Toby Haydock's got that podcast called Indefinable Magic, and I think that they are the words that describe uh, those early years in particular. But even the, the the Troughton years, I mean, Troughton was my first experience of black and white because all of a sudden, uh, when uh, the ABC was doing repeats one day, a black and white episode appeared and it was the mind robber. That was my first experience. And this is not just your typical Doctor Who, it's a standout uh, in, I, I was saying, you know, Doctor Who sort of got into a groove, but the Mind Robber was one of those ones that temporarily jumped out of that groove, and it was pretty a pretty mind blowing story, particularly the end of episode one where the TARDIS exploded. So that sort of captured me straight away. And even the Crotons, which was shown after, there was something about the Crotons, and it, you can look at them objectively, but seeing them for the first time as a kid uh, in that black and white sort of style was something that really grabbed me. Uh, so I, I fell in love with it from those two stories. Yeah, I was absolutely the same. I was six when the Mind Robber and the Crotons were shown on repeat here before they dived back into the Pertwee era yet again. And yeah, I remember watching the Mind Robber that first time and being absolutely captivated by what was going on on screen. It was just, just mind-boggling. It was fantastic. Philip? Now, I, I'm pretty sure that the first black and whites I saw were actually John Pertwee's. So, you know, the Silurians, the first time I saw that was definitely in black and white. The Mind of Evil was definitely black and white. So there's a lot of um, the Pertries that we went through which were black and white. And there is something about the grading and the colour of black and white, or the lack of colour, grading the shadows of black and white to do into a storytelling which is different. Um, I certainly remember, you know, we bought a VCR. Well, I forced my parents to buy a VCR when I knew they were showing The Mind Robber. And that was our first VCR in 1986. It was 85. I'm pretty sure it was 86. Um, and I've got my parents to buy one because I wanted to start taping from Patrick Troughton because he was always my doctor. First from the Target novels, then from Three Doctors. Um, and so I just adored Patrick Troughton. I don't th whether well, this comment you made before, Dwayne, about um, the show was trying to find its feet. I actually don't think it was trying to find its feet for those three years. I think that was its feet. It was deliberately being different constantly which is actually really unique when you look at shows at the same time. I mean, I, I love The Avengers, but The Avengers is a, a, a model that plays over and over and over again with the same beats. Um, Adam Adamant Lives. Any of those shows in the 60s that were there all follow the same model. You know, even Zed Cars, which, you know, and, and other things. Most shows do actually follow a, a, a model. Doctor Who, one of the reasons why I think it endures so well is it, it you know we have those eras where it does change so the Hinchcliffe years compared to you know what happened before with the with the let's years compared to jane to t all are distinct but it does change every two or three years with producers whereas with hartnell every single show was changing and it does last a bit it actually get, does go into the fourth season because i think we still get the highlanders is, is trying some new things underwater menace fails i think but it's trying to do some new things so i think even as we go into the fourth season um it's when we hit the moon base where they actually repeat what is happened the 10th planet because the moon base is basically just a copy of the 10th planet that they start to say actually base under siege and then because of budget constraints they went for trousers well base under siege base under siege all of season five 
But yeah, in, t- in terms of that constant style, um, like Dave, my love of history came from Doctor Who. Most of the locations that Hartnell went to, and and even Petrosian, um history, I've been to. So I went to Culloden, been to Rome, been to actually I've been to South Africa, uh, South America. Yeah, got to do that. But I've actually travelled deliberately to go to those places, and then even to this into the locations as well. So Snowdonia um, and other places I deliberately go to and visit, just because of the Doctor Who connections. No, I've done exactly the same thing. I've only got a couple to go to. I haven't done uh, Cathay yet. And uh, I can't remember if there's another one I've still got to do because I ticked off Troy earlier this year. So that was a big one for me. I see. Cathay I've done. Haven't done Troy. Haven't done South America, the Aztecs. Oh, well, I've, done, I've done the Aztecs. I did that just before COVID hit. Oh, well done. I was going to say, I, I saw pictures of that of, on, on social media with you only a couple of years ago. So, yeah. Excellent. All right, well, it's uh, nice to share some of those uh, thoughts about the magic of the black and white era. We're going to check out Prison in Space now. We're going to climb out of the rabbit hole and and check it out and see where the Prison in Space matches up to the black and white era that we have in our heads. And to kick it off, I'll read a blurb uh, for Prison in Space by Dick Sharples. It was adapted by Simon Gurrier. It says, a relaxing break for the Doctor and his companions, Jamie and Zoe become something decidedly more sinister when they're arrested for trespass. But what has happened to the planet Earth? And how has the malevolent Chairman Babs gained control? As the Doctor and Jamie are incarcerated in a prison that they can never escape from, Zoe is forced to change sides. Here's a trailer. Coming soon from Big Finish Productions, Doctor Who, The Lost Stories. The Second Doctor box set. They advanced on him, slowly, deliberately. You saw what they did to that man? It it doesn't mean they'd do the same to us. If you think I'm going to stay around just to find out... Me neither. You're a man, aren't you? Defender of the faithful, the people and the state in the name of truth and justice. Men of the world unite. You've nothing to lose but your chains. Chairman Babs, where are you taking me? You may be a criminal, but you're still a woman. You seem to have emasculated every other man on this planet, but you won't bully us into submission. I just who do you think you are, you mealy mouthed old besom? So, Dave, I'll get you to go first on this one, since you're the guest. What were your... Uh, Did you have any preconceptions before you went into this? Uh, I'd be lying if I said I didn't, because I do recall reading the Prison in Space article in DWM way, way back when they were doing a whole feature on uh, stories that were written but not produced. And that certainly clouded its reputation for me. I was expecting a very particular sort of thing. I got some of that, but I also got a lot more than what I expected, which was interesting and made for a good listen. It's a very difficult production to judge because judging on different criteria, I would give it very different grades. As a produced piece of audio, it's very well made. As a B-movie type space adventure, it's got some quite positive, fun moments and some big ideas that I quite enjoy. Uh, Hanging over it all, though, is some incredibly problematic and awful sexual politics that drags the whole thing down and I think is uh, I think just makes it a very bad story and let's face it so bad that the production team looked at it and said we can't make this quick somebody please you know what have you got and thankfully Terence Dick said I've got my mate Robert Holmes who's written the Crotons and that's how we got that but it's it's very difficult to judge it and if you're judging it as a piece of history in just knowing what could have happened it's fascinating i think big finish gives us a fantastic insight into what could have been that's a really positive thing but what could have been definitely shouldn't have been i don't know i certainly went in with the preconception that it was a, a lot more sexist than i felt it was we, i mean philip you and i have uh, also also talked about the six doctor story what was that called again that was very sexist. The, what was that? The one with Sill? Is that the one? I reckon, I reckon it's going to be Mission to Magnus. Yes, yeah, so that's right. Mission, Mission to Magnus. Magnus. Yeah, that's it. That that was that was pretty bad, uh, and that even came through in 
the uh, the Lost Stories recording that Big Finish did. But I didn't think this was as bad because I quickly came to this as it was a comedy, a comedy to me. So, And that's what I was trying to do. It was, it was an exaggeration of all these sexual politics uh, of the time. The, the, the politics was getting flipped on its head, uh, taken to the extreme. It wasn't meant to be a serious science fiction story. And potentially that's that was the problem. It didn't really fit in with everything else that was going on in Doctor Who at that time, because this, I mean, this was a comedy script, but it wasn't the it wasn't the first time Doctor Who had attempted comedy, but it had been a long time since Doctor Who had done comedy, I think. Uh, what about you, Philip? Well, actually, firstly, Dan, why, why did you listen to this out of curiosity? Uh, because these are the types of big finishes that I'm most interested in, these what could have been, so whether it's the alternate season 23 or the season 27 that wasn't made uh, or stuff like this. And I, I think I'd just listened to the Masters of Luxor and I really enjoyed the Masters of Luxor. I thought that was just a wonderful production. And I looked on the website at what else there was in a similar vein and Prison in Space jumped out at me and I thought, you know what, I've, I've heard of this story many times. It's always mentioned in dark corners and giggled about by fans who know about it. And I thought, well, I haven't actually listened to it. And all I've read is a summary in DWM about 20 years ago. Let's give it a crack. Hmm. Okay, good. That's just curious to know why. Um, so when I first bought it, when it came out, I listened to maybe half of it and turned it off because I thought it was just dreadful, like really awful. I hated the sexual politics. I hated um, the way it was being told. And so when it came up in our random selection, so we had to, had to listen to it. I thought I've got to listen to the whole thing now. It was interesting. I did a bit of research beforehand. So I actually did a bit of research with Dick Shuffles, who wrote the story, and discovered he was actually a comedy writer. He used to write sitcoms. And that actually changed how I listened to it to start off with, in terms of, okay, so he's got this background of sitcoms. He's got this background of uh, comedy writing, even some cartoonism. Um, and so when I started listening to it, I started listening with, with that in mind. And I, it, it was hard to tell, and I think it's actually it's the fault of the direction, this is actually Carry On Doctor Who. And once, once I realised that this is in the vein of the Carry On films of the 60s, it made sense about what they were trying to do. Have they done it well? Once again, it's hard to know whether they've done it well or not. If they'd made it on TV, would they have got the fact that this was Carry On Doctor Who? And even even is, is, is Carry On a place that Doctor Who should be on? I don't know. Um, but the sexism and the silly jokes and the way they treat the companions and even Jamie smacking... Zoe's bum at the end that was all in the vein of carry on films um, and so I think if the director if, if when they directed it I think they'd been a bit bolder with their direction and gone full out comedy I think it would, would have worked a bit better um, but I think Lisa has um, yeah I think she's been cautious in how she's done it and she's tried to deliver a straight script I think as a straight script it doesn't quite work that's a very interesting take, and I'm certainly pondering my views on it in, in light of what the two of you have said. I, I think, Phil, you're making some good points in terms of how it's been delivered. The problem, I think, though, stands in that there are bits of it that just don't work and that I think drag the whole thing down. Now, look, the planet of women is a thing that's been done in science fiction for many, many years and many, many iterations. There's a Blake 7 version. There's a Star Trek The Next Generation version. And those episodes aren't great, but they're done with such knowing campness that they almost get away with it. And I think in a couple of cases do get away with it. Whereas you're right, they don't lean into the camp here. But I think the biggest problem is that Chairman Babs doesn't fit or work into what you're saying as a, as a carry-on type story. I think Chairman Babs is on the one hand, seen as a very powerful, charismatic, effective dictator, somebody who was able to entrance and take over a world basically through the force of personality and is utterly ruthless in the way that she uh, uses that power and tries to keep that power, yet she completely falls apart when she meets the Doctor and makes ridiculous decisions and falls in love with him and ends up crying because the doctor wants to to leave her and and i think that that just tears that character down from having any sort of um from really being as strong as she actually was written at some times um and, and even the name i mean chairman babs i think 
is a deliberate attempt to really undermine that character. And I just don't think the vibe quite works. I think it's the same with Jamie and Drag. And then, yes, when you do end up with Zoe having a smack bottom at the end, there's just these these key moments that I think are just wrong, that even if they were done in a camp way, I don't think they would be funny. I certainly don't think they'll be acceptable. And that does mean that in an adventure where, as I say, there is some good space adventures, some good fun moments, it's punctuated with these quite awful moments that I don't think you can get away with as just being camp. Maybe I'm being a bit harsh on it, but but I'm, I'm interested, you know, as I say, listening to you give that alternative. I can see where you're coming from for some, but I don't think it excuses all. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not saying it's acceptable. I'm just sort of saying that's what they've done. No, 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 I'm not, I'm not saying that. So, so, the, so the, I mean, the carry on, I mean, I think you particularly carry on nurse, um, and, I, I, and I should know, I don't know the actresses and, and that, but you know, there, there was the, that really big, in the carry on films, a very large set nurse, very tall, and she was always this, you know, very nasty female, always bullying people. But then at some point, there would be some man who'd come along and suddenly she'd throw all that away for the love of a man. So I, I don't think it's I don't think it's well done. I mean I think in this case it's not been well done. But I think that's what I think that's what Dick was got Dick Sharps was going for um when he wrote it. But I think the direction hasn't the direction hasn't decided to go either all in, which I think you needed to do. You need to either go all into the carry on film or you need to well just not do it really because it just doesn't work. I mean you're right, I mean yeah you know, the whole chairman babs I don't think that I don't think the I mean the actress they 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 cast was that's the only actor aside from um, Fraser Hines and Wendy Padbury that they cast was was the um, Chairman Babs, uh, and I think you know, she, I mean it's not that she's not a great actress, um, which is you know, Susan Brown. So Susan Brown, you know, is a very accomplished, good actress, but the voice she was putting on was just a bit too old and aged and then quite fit. And there's yeah, there's I think there's just a few things which you know, made it suffer. Well, she was 120 something years old. Yes, but she, but the drugs were supposed to keep her young as well. True. I, yeah. yeah I just, so so there's just there's just cho- choices that were made, which I think maybe should be pulled back on. Yeah, and I do wonder if because of the reputation that this has had in fandom, even before the big finish was made, whether big finish did feel a little bit embarrassed or ashamed that they were making it, and they thought, well, just to make sure everybody knows that we're not cool with this, we won't lean too far into it because we don't want people to think that we're on its side, and that has permeated some of the way that they have put it together. Mm. I mean, they, they obviously, I mean, the choice to leave Jamie smacking Zoe at the end was obviously a deliberate choice because it, it really is not something that you would put in or is appropriate to put in, I don't think. And so the fact that that, that, that scene was so well known, because that was always a scene that was criticised by fans in terms of everyone knew, you know, there was a smacking bottom scene. Um, they could have chosen to, to leave that out, but they, they still deliberately chose to put it in. But then once again, I'm not sure it was played. Actually, it wasn't as offensive as I expected to be when I got to it. I, I was expected to be far more offended. And the fact that it you know, cleared her memory and things. But, uh, you know, any man smacking a woman, not, not happy. <laughs> Yeah, look, look, I'm, I'm glad they left it in because I think if you're doing an historical curiosity, yeah. you've got to present it so that we can judge it for what it was. And and I think that that does mean that you know, we can see the good with the bad. We can see, I think we can see, as you're, you're describing, the intent of the writer as well. I don't, I don't think the writer set out to write a horribly misogynistic polemic. I think that he's written something that he thinks is clever, fun, inverse, holding a mirror up, all of those sort of things. Um and just being a bit clumsy about it. And we can judge that because we can see the whole thing as it was, or sorry, as it was meant to be. Yeah. I mean, even the whole Jamie Drag stuff too. It's interesting. I was reading one review uh, online and they, and they were talking about misogyny and feminism and that there wasn't, there wasn't much difference between the two, just one thing. And I couldn't help but think that too, when I was listening to uh, some of the female characters talking about men as inferiors and things like that. You don't have to go too far on uh, the internet to find uh, some feminists who uh, do feel that way <laughs> about men. So I, I found it, it it was almost prophetic in a way. But anyway, that's just what I thought of that. Um, one of the well, things... Uh, no, I mean, I know, I mean, it's, it's worth talking about. I mean, the early stages of feminism had started by the time this was written in the 60s. And so certainly feminism was something that was known generally ridiculed and so i do think that the author was leaning into that ridicule of feminism at that point it certainly is feminism as written by middle-aged men yes (laughs) (laughs) 
I still see some young women who do uh, speak that way uh, freely without the influence of middle-aged men at all. Or maybe they've been watching this or listening to it. I don't know. I, I, I take sorry. I take your point there, Dwayne. I just want to explore that for thirty seconds because I do understand the point you're making. But if that's what the author's intending to do, he's got the wrong characters making those points. And I think that if he wanted to make those points, he should have found uh, a better way for the audience to get in there rather than make it uh, make make those characters fascist guards. Basically, I think that really clouds the metaphor that maybe he's trying to cast. Yeah. I, I don't think, honestly, though, I don't think he's trying to make that a metaphor at all. He's doing it by accident, and it just so happens to fit in with today's politics to a yeah, degree. And, that, and that's where I come from. I think that a lot of this is clumsy more than anything. Yeah, absolutely. One of the things that the Lost Stories uh, intends to do or, or seeks to do to the listener is to make these stories appear black and white in your imagination. Um, did did it achieve this for you, David? It did, actually. And I think when they were doing a lot of the description and a lot of the staging, I did find in my mind I was thinking of stuff like the Space Pirates. I was thinking of stuff like the Crotons. And so when they would describe what would have been a model shot, I was thinking about, uh, as I say, those, those sort of comp comparable trout and stories. And it did conjure them up in my mind when they talked about the medical room on the prison it did feel like the medical room in the wheel in space for example that was absolutely the sort of vibe they got um the one exception is probably the very start of part one where they talked about being in some sort of tropical paradise and i thought i can't think of anything in doctor who never mind the 60s full stop that's ever really properly captured the idea of a tropical paradise uh, yeah. so that that felt a bit bizarre Emma, the enemy of the world a cold beach in, in, in England <laughs> pretending to be pretending. Brisbane. <laughs> yeah, no. I, I, was, I was thinking the Ark the, the, with the, the elephants and things. I thought that was pretty close. It's probably the closest they got. That's a really good pull, but even the Ark feels like a studio. Well, I think this would still have felt like a studio. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 absolutely. And I, th I think that's... But, but as I was saying, I think, I think that everywhere else Big Finish captured that idea of a studio-bound... Trout and story really well. It was just that first five to ten minutes. I thought they're really leaning into this, you know, trying to make it sound and feel like a tropical jungle. And um, no, it just wouldn't have. It would have, would have been a very cheap jungle, or probably would have been a couple of pot plants in a quarry. Oh, the only thing I was going to add in terms of costume was I actually had a bit of the um, Robomen from the movie um, Dalek Invasion Earth um because of the um the black leather and things so i must have been i was i was thinking the shiny shiny vinyl but now dave mentioned the space pirates i can actually see yeah, that's that's the sort of costuming that they're putting, putting the women in the one thing that got this in the black and white era for me more than anything else i think was the music and it was two two musicians on this david darlington and jamie robertson who are still doing lots for big finish uh i think david darlington does the little stings and motifs that sounded like something Don Harper did in The Invasion. Did you pick up on that at all? Yeah, I thought it was a very nice little pastiche of, of 60s music. I thought it was very effectively done. Yeah, I think you'll find that Dave Darlington either did this one or did the Dalek one, and then Jane Robinson would have done the other one. That's right. That's, so it's, that's a, question, what it's a question of which one did. I suspect this was David Darlington, do you think? I, I think Simon Gurria does mention David in the credits. Yeah, Jamie's a bit more, well, actually, I haven't listened to the Dalek one, but Jamie's was a bit more melodic with his tunes and things, and this was a, a lot more, yeah, it's a, yeah, a bit more of the Dudley Simpson style of chromatic stuff. Well, like I said, definitely Don Harper, so that's very uh, synonymous with the, it was the only story he did was The Invasion, wasn't it, Don Harper? Yep. Hmm. Yeah, so I thought that fit into season six beautifully. Any final thoughts on Prison in Space, Philip? Well, I'm I'm glad I finally listened to the end, <laughs> and as I said, once once I once I decided this was a carry on film, and saw all the carry on tropes being played, you know, all the changes of character and the silly sexist uniforms and the smacked bottoms and the people in drag, um, I was a bit more content with what was going on. Still, don't think it's acceptable, <laughs> but at least I could all put it in its context. So I'm I'm glad I finally listened to it, but I think it was probably a good thing it was never made. Well, I'm glad I listened to it again. 
uh, I loved it. I loved every minute of it. I think I loved it the most out of all three of us. And I would definitely go back and give this one another listen. Dave? So give us give us a sentence on why, because you've been a bit, bit quiet. You've asked the questions. What, what made you love it so much? I think it captures the feel of Series 6, but injects the comedy of the Hartnell era that I love. I, I particularly was, you know, made me think of the Romans with, you know, Babs chasing the doctor around, like Nero chased Barbara around. So, you know, this when it's in when it's in reverse, no one seems to mention that as an issue. But um, you know, when Nero's, you know, basically trying to uh to have his way with Barbara. But um it's comedy. It's comedy. So it's all exaggerated and I love comedy in Doctor Who. When I was that age, when it first came out, I probably wouldn't have um, wouldn't have enjoyed it. I was a bit more serious then, but I've a bit more relaxed when it comes to comedy in Doctor Who these days. Yeah, fair enough. It's the it's the comedy factor more than anything that does it for me. No, yeah, fair enough. Uh, well, look, I've I've got I know a very um, disjointed sense of humour, and uh, it didn't land for me as a comedy. So maybe that's why I'm I'm, I'm more down in it than uh, than certainly you, Joanne. I think I think both of you. As I say, I think that as a historical artefact, it's a really fascinating piece. And I really give credit to Big Finish for having the guts to do it because it was controversial when this was commissioned. I remember that at the time. And so I'm really glad that they've done it. I'm really glad they have leaned into and made it a really good uh, evocation of the season six era of Doctor Who. I think that it's lovingly done. I think there's some good adventure in there. There's some nice concepts in there. There's some good ideas in there. There are some bits that I love quite a lot. Um, I, I don't know whether it's trying to be a comedy or not, but either way, it didn't land for me as a comedy, and therefore some of the more uh, problematic moments fell particularly flat for me and, and did drag it down. But no, I'm, I'm really glad it was made. It was a very interesting listen, if nothing else. I do think Fraser Hines and Wendy Patterbridge did an amazing job in the storytelling. It, it felt like a full cast production, and there's only three of them, and most of it was, yeah, most of it was probably narrated. But it didn't come across that way, so I, I, yeah, I, I will give all credit to the job they did and Simon Gurrier for you know making turning a full TV production into three voices. He did well. I certainly think that having listened to Fraser Hines play Patrick Troughton in an actual drama, one of the I think it was Return to Tell Us or something like that, I listened to about a year ago. I thought he felt really, really flat on that. I think it just sounded then like Fraser Hines having a conversation with himself, and the second Doctor sounded just like Jamie. But here, when it is that more staged thing of you know that it's just three actors and they're all doing the different voices, it, you, you get away with it a lot more. And I think that Fraser does get the energy of Patrick Troughton really, really effectively. Uh, so that's fine for something like this. It works really, really well. Um, I don't think he sounds like Patrick Troughton, and I don't think he should play the second Doctor in a full cast drama. Um, I think that's a mistake. But no, it works really well here. Well, they have actually recast the second Doctor now. It's Michael Troughton. So Patrick's son's actually playing him in full cast audios now. Okay, I didn't know that. I might have to check one of those out sometime. Excellent. Well, uh, can I just say, Dave, thanks so much for coming on uh, to chat with us about Prison in Space. It was, it's been good to get a, a different point of view. Fantastic. Thank you. Do you want to just tell us a bit about your podcast before you go? Uh, yes, so my colleague Rob and I host the Doctor Who show. We do a monthly flagship episode every month. And in between that, we have occasional reviews, hot takes of new Doctor Who. We have the List Makers, which is a spin-off podcast and a whole bunch of other things. So look for us at the Doctor Who show. Or alternatively, if you like Blake 7, I co-host Spacefall, a Blake 7 podcast as well. I was going to say, Spacefall is actually my favourite podcast that you do. And a goodies one. I, I, I discovered you via the goodies. So I actually was... Listen to all your goodies podcasts first and watch the episodes and then realize you did Doctor Who one, so move to Doctor Who and then Blake Seven. So No, yeah. thank you. Thank you very much for that. That's that's very kind of you. And yes, the, the Goodies Pirate Podcast was the first one that uh, a group of us down here did, and we're very proud of going through the goodies. And gee, if you want to talk about some clumsy and problematic metaphors that are always landing, <laughs> you've, you've got the goodies right there. But uh no, that was that was that was really fun. Was, I know yeah. you say down here, but it's probably not too often that there's someone further down than you, Dave, and that's me in Tasmania. <laughs> no, fantastic. No, I appreciate that. Look, Tasmania is where my dad lived in when he was a teenager and when he would have been watching season six, in fact. So I do have quite a fond uh, love of Tasmania. All right, Dave, we'll stick around. We're going to talk about a companion chronicle. We won't uh, have you join us for that because uh, I know you haven't heard it. But uh, will you stick around and uh, give us a recommendation at the end? 
Yeah, happy to. Thank you. Fantastic. Coming soon from Big Finish Productions. Doctor Who, The Companion Chronicles. The Perpetual Bond. Harper speaking. Hello? Sorry, Mr. Flowers. Call from my mother, having a bit of a crisis. Hoped I could slip out for an hour. Sarah Kingdom was dead. I'd watched, unable to help as she aged to death before my eyes. We destroyed the Daleks, stopped them using the time destructor against the solar system, but we'd lost our friend in the process. Aliens? You've seen something? The Doctor chewed on a slice of buttered toast and smiled. You think they're something else? What do they want here? I came out of Mr. Flower's office, and there were dozens of these chaps. The whole company's been invaded. There's another alien by that store. That one. He's a clerk. There are so many of them. And only we can see them? Let's find out what they're selling. Subscribers get more at bigfinish.com. All right, so that was a trailer for The Companion Chronicles, The Perpetual Bond. Here's the blurb. When the TARDIS materialises at a familiar junkyard in the 1960s, the Doctor and Stephen are soon embroiled in a mystery in the City of London. Who are the mysterious bowler-hatted businessmen with their deadly umbrellas? And what secret is young Oliver Harper desperately trying to conceal? Contracts have been signed. A deal is in place. And the Doctor discovers that perhaps not even he can stop a terrible business. So, Philip, uh, this was written by Simon Gurria, so it's a Simon Gurria episode tonight. Yes, both of them. And he, he's done many Companion Chronicles and early adventures, and he specialises in the black and white era of Doctor Who on audio. So what was your uh, overall opinion of uh, this story? As you know, the Companion Chronicles hold a very special place in my heart. <laughs> Mine too. Mine too. They're getting more and more special to me because, you know, I've, I've got them all. I just haven't had the, I haven't made the time to listen to them all, and doing this is making me really appreciate them more than ever before. Well, that's a good thing. So I'm just adoring these stories. I think it's the way that you have to be more creative when you've got a smaller cast, and this is another perfect example of how creative you can be and tell such a big story. So yeah, I mean, uh, Tom Allen comes in as a new companion. So there's a trilogy of stories uh, with Oliver Harper, and this is his introduction story, played by comedian Tom Allen. Uh, who is you know, a very big name in the UK. Um, I, don't, I don't think he's quite so familiar on Australian screens. We do get him in some of the British comedies and you know, panel shows and panel comedy quiz shows a bit. But you know, he's, he's very large in the UK. But this is sort of um, early in his career, because it's about th- 11, 12 years ago that this was done. Um, as you said, Simon Gary, who's just a master writer for this sort of genre, Though, that being said, anything that Simon writes, I love. And it's Peter Purvis in fine form. So set, yeah, set in the UK, set around the time of um, Ian and Barbara coming back to England. There's, a, there's an interesting discussion about going and visiting them because mm. the Doctor really gets the opportunity to go visit. Um, of course, we know in television law, the first time the Doctor goes back to 60s London is the War Machines. But in fact, Big Finish tells us that actually he went back to the 60s before then. And there's a lovely line about the Stephen talk about um, because the Doctor's just down a bit, because this is, this is after the events of um, the Dark Master Plan, and I think it's like before the before the massacre. So, you know, Sarah has died, Katrina, Katri, Katriana has died, Brett Vaughan has died, the Doctor's in a bad place, not not as bad as it would be after the massacre, after there's even more death. But this is sort of the Doctor's it down, and he has the opportunity to go visit Ian and Barbara, or there's an adventure. And, you know, Stephen knows, actually, an adventure for the Doctor? That's more important. And so off they go to this adventure. So loved it. What about you, Dwayne? I love this story too. And it's actually not the first time I'd heard it because you had raved about this trilogy when I think we were talking with Peter Purvis. Uh, this, this story was brought up during that interview. So you can go back and check that out, folks. So I don't think I listened to the rest of the trilogy, though. I only listened to this one. So I've listened to this one twice and I haven't heard the, the ones that, that follow. Oh, but you have to. I know, I know. It's a sensational start to to what promises to be an awesome trilogy, and I take your word for it that it is. And I love 
the setting of the 60s. It's interesting because as we were talking, I was thinking earlier, I couldn't think of many stories that have been set in the 60s. Uh, but there was. There's the War Machines. There's... Um, yeah, the the unit story and the invasion. There's other things, uh, other stories that I could think of um, that are set in the '60s. But from now, listening to a brand new story set in the '60s as a historical um, setting is something that I would like to see a lot more. I, I love the '60s as a decade. I think there's lots of exciting, interesting things happening there politically, musically. Um, there's a, a, it's a decade of, of change. And what this story, uh, deals with is the, is the alien menace is taking advantage of the leftovers from the second world war. So not only have we got this change happening during the sixties, we've also got what's left over from the, the war and, uh, civilization is still in that recovery phase. And I was thinking this is set in, uh, 66, right? So if Ian and Barbara were dropped off, it'd be 1966. Um, it, it's only 20 years uh, since the war finished, 21 years. So not a very long time. So yeah, the world would have been in a in a very, uh, not fragile place, but in a place where it was still rebuilding. So I think it's an excellent setting. And Simon has chosen this story really well. And I love the way that it's been weaved into the history of what's going on on the planet at this particular point in time. It's a story of alien invasion that, you know, it could be done in any number of genres or ways or, um, but it's, it's uniquely done here for Doctor Who. And I think this is a, a story that suits the first Doctor era perfectly. Yeah, no, I, I fully agree. And yeah, it just played superbly. Um, I think Lisa Bowman does a brilliant job with directing this. I think the way she gets her cast members just to um, p the pitch and the rhythm she gets out of them, uh, I think it's just really strong. Um, yeah, there's, there's nothing really I can thought about. It. Do do make sure you listen to the rest of the trilogy, mm. um, all written by Simon Gurrier, and the, and the last one called the First Wave is actually the first time a Doctor Who monster. Uh, appears it's going to appear many other times before in the, oh, the it's, wave. A Varden. it's got to be the Vardens it is the Vardens <laughs> um, so yeah we actually get to meet the Vardens with the first Doctor and it is stunningly right. done and desperately done and yeah it's a very emotional ending so in the blurb that I read it talks about a, a, a mystery or a secret that Oliver Harper is trying to conceal and we don't actually get to find out what that secret is which is also another interesting political element of the '60s that they throw into this, uh, which is examined, no doubt, in the further in the next two stories. It is indeed. Which, which is also part of why I guess Oliver is able to break free of the type of perception filter that the aliens had on everybody working. Uh, That's right. I think it was I think it was his uh, stress about whatever this secret is that made him break through, and was able to see the aliens for what they really were. So a fascinating story. And yes, definitely one that I could see in black and white. You mentioned Lisa Bauman. And ever since we spoke to her and she talked about how she likes to place music in story, she, she's, a, she's more of a minimalist when it comes to music. So I always listen out for where she places sounds, music. She's very uh, meticulous when it comes to that. And so that is one of her defining stamps, I guess, as a director, is that she's very minimal when it comes to uh, music. Uh, and that's no exception here, but the black and white era era was also minimal in music in, in some uh, stories as well. Well, it was hard for them to use music because they had to play the music live in the studio. So it all had to be recorded first and then they played in live as opposed it to actually, later on. It actually reminds they... me, sorry, sorry, it reminds me that when we were talking once before, I think it was on another podcast actually, we were talking about uh, incidental music and I could only think of The Smugglers that was uh, as, as a story that didn't have any incidental music at all but I've just got The um, Abominable Snowmen and that's got no music in it either. Did you realise that? I don't think I did. Because all you've got in it is the monastery <laughs> sounds, you've got the you've got monastery, you've got monks singing that's, chanting, that's yep. the music so that's yeah, ch chanting and so that's another example of a, of a 
black and white story that uses zero incidental music whatsoever. So just a bit of trivia there for you, Philip, if you want to grab a copy of that animated story that's just been released in Australia. I will be getting that one because I love that story. It is very good. It's, uh, it's nicely done. And I hope we get some more animations, please. RTD, yeah, Disney, so. whoever's, whoever's looking after it now. Sony, whoever. Paul McGann series first. Yes, yes, we do need the Paul McGann series. Okay, I want to talk about the artwork. I think it's a beautiful piece of artwork. The one niggling thing that stands out to me on that artwork is the growth, the facial hair. I don't think that is uh, true to the period. I don't think a, a businessman with a bowler hat would have a growth in the 60s. It would be totally clean shaven. What do you think? Or a beard. So you could possibly have a full beard. Or... Yeah, but a, a short full beard, yeah. Yes. But none of this yeah. growth business. No, you are right. You, it wouldn't be that sort of look at all. I suspect that's the actor when they took the photos. I would say so. <laughs> and they surely they could, have, they could have brushed that out, surely. Decided not to Photoshop it out. But I think it's a, a it's an outstanding cover, and I love... Is that St. Paul's on is the cover Paul's that I can cathedral? see? Uh, it's got Big Ben. What's the other oh, building he between? The next, okay, that's interesting, because he hasn't got it in the next one. I'm just, I'm just looking at the covers, the next two covers. And right. he hasn't got the growth of those two. So, yeah, that's a, that's a deliberate choice that they've made. So it's a bit of an oddity, that uh, that growth. Um, don't know. Don't know why it's there. It just wouldn't have fit in in the 60s, that particular era, in that kind of uh, social atmosphere, I don't think. Yeah. Well, I mean, Simon Hollow does lovely covers all the time. Yeah. I mean, it's, I, I can overlook it. It's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful with the with the moon there and Sir Paul's Big Ben. The other buildings, the sixties, sixties London is just, yeah, it's just, it's just sensational. So, uh, being a, a fan of the old twelve-inch records, yeah, artwork is very important and certainly important when I'm listening to these. Uh, oh, the, you can almost call them classic stories now. They're getting on in age, aren't they? They do feel like classics. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> All right. That's all I've got to say. Have you got anything else to say about Perpetual Pond? No. Final just, thoughts? No, get it. It's fantastic. And get, get the whole trilogy, though. Find out what the secret is. What, what is the story uh, that comes after this called? The story that comes after this is the ice code, sorry, the cold equations. The cold equations. All right. Which is a lot of it set, set out on a planet, uh, set out on a moon. We've got to hurry and get back because Dave's waiting for us for our recommendations. So oh, I'll, throw okay. in a trailer for, I'll throw in a trailer for The Cold Equations and then uh, we'll be back in a moment with our recommendations with Dave. Brilliant. Coming soon from Big Finish Productions, Doctor Who, The Companion Chronicles, The Cold Equations. Oliver, there's nothing we can do. No thrust, no retros, no way to move us. And the Doctor's not coming to save us. The young trader from London in his old-fashioned suit had just made his first trip in the TARDIS. The Doctor beamed, jabbing a finger at Oliver. I should say that that planet down there is a treasure trove. That's what you're doing here. Hmm? You forage around on the surface and bring back whatever you think you can sell. You've even got plant stocks to flourish up here. And birds as well. You mean they're like scrap dealers? Or archaeologists? Or something in between? Whichever way you run the numbers, they only show one thing. There are still people down there, under that cloud. So why have you not done a deal with them? The doctor only chuckled. <laughs> we won't appear in your list. We don't get involved in the places we visit. Or, if we do, we take care not to leave a trace. Perhaps you should tell me your secret now. My what? You know perfectly well what I mean. Subscribers get more at bigfinish.com All right, so that was uh, The Perpetual Bond. Uh, great to listen to that uh, once again, Philip. And I know how much you love. We got to we got to have a chat with Simon Gurry at some point. We do. I'm trying to get him. <laughs> Keep trying. Keep plugging away. All right. Uh, that only leaves us two things. The, the The first thing we need to do is we need to uh, select the next two stories for our instalment of. We've got randomoids. Oh! 
Oh, I can't believe I didn't put that in at the start. That's outrageous. Um, we're going to select two stories for our next Randomoid show uh, using the Big Finish Randomoid Selectatron. I'm going to cue the music right there, and we're going to go into our first pick. Here's one I prepared earlier, Philip. Uh, our first choice is a Six Doctor and Evelyn story. It is Medicinal Purposes. Oh, with David Tennant. That would be David excellent. Tennant. Yes, that'll be good. Playing a very, very different character to the Doctor. All right, let's go to our second choice. And it is... Ah, there you go. It's a Seventh Doctor and Bonnie Langford story called We Are the Daleks. Do you remember oh, that one? I do That's number, that one. number 201 in the main range. It was sort of a reboot. They got to 200 and decided to start a different direction. And that was the first one. Really, really good stuff. Even though I don't like the Daleks very much. No. I did, did we chat with Bonnie about that one? I don't think we talked to her. No. No, we didn't. There were so many we could have chatted about. But, uh, but uh, And we've got to remember that these actors only spend a day on these. So... Uh, as little as they remember about the TV show, they're even going to remember less about these ones. Um, so there are two for next month. And that only leaves us to, for, to, uh, to talk about our recommendations for this week. And uh, I wonder whose turn it is. Uh, Philip, any ideas? Uh, I've got no idea. Whose turn is it? It's Ray? your turn. Well, there you go. What a surprise that is. Um, I'm going to recommend an audio book. Um, you know, I'm a big fan of the Doctor Who Target books and they're all coming out. And the one I've been listening to at the moment is Doctor Who and the Android Invasion um, by Terence Dix, read by Jeffrey Beavers. Um, it's, I mean, it's not one of Terence's best books, but Jeffrey really reads it so well, really captivated with his voices. Um, I love his Sarah Jane Smith, but undercurrent of a bit of score, um, so there's some nice music, some nice effects, and it makes a bit more sense at the end when the eye patch is revealed to show an eye, because... Why you wouldn't look under an eye patch for 20 years is beyond me, but there you go. So, yeah, if, if people he like... He writes to, in an explanation, eh? Yeah, well, it covers it a bit. Anyhow, if you like um, Target novels, and um, this, is a, this is a great little production, The Android Invasion, Jeffrey Beavers. Excellent. What about you, Dave? What, about, uh, what have you been listening to recently that you'd like to uh, tell our listeners about? Well, we started the conversation, Dwayne, by talking about the 60s and how much we love it and how wonderful the writing can be and how imaginative they can be and how Philip and I got our love of history from them. And in fact, I mentioned my trip to Troy, so I'm going to recommend something I've been listening to since I got back from Troy, which is the BBC audio soundtrack release of The Myth Makers, which is one of the wittiest scripts that I think Doctor Who has ever done. Hartnell absolutely revels in what's going on there. It captures the siege of Troy in a way that could only be done so effectively on audio. Um, but you you sense the terror as the, the horse is wheeled into Troy when you know what's coming on. But just Hartnell having some great comedic moments in a very funny script in ancient Troy, I think is really, really wonderful. And if, if listeners haven't listened to that audio, I strongly recommend it. It's a wonderful story. Absolutely. The, 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 the dialogue in that alone um you don't need any visuals to make it to make me laugh out loud i just have i have several laugh out loud moments throughout that story and i love it all right i'm going to recommend uh a podcast that we did only very re recently it was a bonus episode um and it's uh, a tribute that we did to david warner so if you haven't heard that yet get over and have a listen we've got contributions from uh gary russell annette badland um, Tom Selinsky, John Dorney, Nigel Fares, Susanna Harker as well, uh, Nick Briggs uh, as well. Is that Did I cover and, everybody? And Lisa Bauman. Oh, Lisa Bauman too, of course. So check that out because while I was putting it together, I'd realised that I'd never seen uh, Time Bandits, I'd never seen uh, The Omen, and I'd never seen Time After Time. And over this weekend, I watched them all and uh, loved them absolutely fantastic uh films uh you can see why people love him so much um did you love time bandits too dave i remember watching time bandits when i was very very young on my father's knee and not really getting it um, but thinking it was wonderful and then watching it again when i was a teenager and absolutely loving it yeah 
Yeah, it's good stuff. So uh, that's that's our recommendations. Thanks so much, Dave, for sticking around uh, and uh, spending some time with us. It's been great uh, to have your company. No, it's been great to finally do this with you guys. We've been talking over various different formats for years and years and years and listening to each other, and now we've got to talk. It's been fun. Fantastic. And you know I love your company too, Philip. Oh, of course Don't feel do. left how, out. How can you not? So thank you, Dwayne. <laughs> Thanks so much, David, for joining us. It's been great. My pleasure. Thank you, guys. This has been the Sirens of Audio episode 135, Randomoids 15, featuring the stories Prison in Space and The Perpetual Bond, with our guest David Kitchen from The Doctor Who Show and your hosts Philip Edney and Dwayne Bunny. Original theme music composed by Joe Kramer. Our website is sirensofaudio.com. You can email us at sirensofaudio at gmail.com or contact us via any one of our socials. Thanks for listening, audiophiles. We'll hear you next time.